You're listening to the Talking Headways Podcast Network. This is Talking Headways, a weekly podcast about sustainable transportation and urban design. I'm Jeff Wood. This week, we're joined by Mike Warren, Senior Vice President at WSP. Mike chats with us about road user charging, including how the discussion has changed over the last decade, and the idea of treating roads as a utility by paying for driving by the mile. Stay with us. Today's podcast is brought to you by our wonderful, amazing Patreon supporters. Your support is critical to Talking Headways and Mondays at the Overhead Wire. We really appreciate it. To join this gang of zoning misfits and transportation rabble-rousers, go to patreon.com slash the Overhead Wire. $2 a month gets you some stickers and a handwritten note. $10 a month gets you one of our transportation scarves. Thanks so much to everybody who supports the show, from the bus drivers to the advocates all around the world. That's patreon.com slash the Overhead Wire. And for more information on our work and where to find our daily newsletter, the Transportation Scarves, our Cars Are Cholesterol merch, buy books from the authors that join us on the show at our bookshop affiliate site, or find our audiobook version of Raymond Unwin's Town Planning and Practice, check out the show notes on your podcatcher or visit theoverheadwire.com. Hey everyone, thanks for listening to the Talking Headways podcast, especially through your podcatchers. With the unfortunate news that Stitcher will stop operations on August 29th, we hope you'll continue to listen on other services. You can find us on Spotify, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Overcast, Pocket Cast, TuneIn, and many, many more. We'll put our RSS feed in the show notes if that helps you make the switch. Thanks again for listening to Talking Headways. We really do appreciate it, especially those of you who keep coming back each and every week. Well, Mike Warren, welcome to the Talking Headways podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Well, thanks for being here. Before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so um, I am a management consultant, strategic consultant, project manager, technologist, innovator for all things transportation. I've been involved in road usage charging, which we'll certainly talk about in more detail, but I've been involved in that since uh, really for the past 12 years, doing everything from systems design all the way through project management, policy development, outreach, communications, operations. I've testified to legislatures before. I've presented findings. I've written reports, uh, thousands, thousands of pages of reports in states, everything ranging from Oregon, California, all the way to the East Coast. So uh, I currently live in Northern Colorado, about 45 minutes north of Denver. And I've been with WSP, my current employer, for six years, just helping promote this concept across the country. Awesome. And how did you get interested in transportation initially? Was it something that you found out early on, or is it something that came from your education or just fell into it? It's very interesting. I, I really stumbled into it. My background prior to this was in the defense and communication space. I'm an Air Force veteran doing wireless communications, combat comm, battlefield type scenarios, battlefield type deployments. And I had worked in the defense community for many, many years, started to look for something different. And it just so happened that the Oregon Department of Transportation needed somebody that understood technical requirements and understood procurement and understood communication standards. So I got pulled into that. And that was back in, oh gosh, I guess it was 2011 with the Oregon Road Usage Charge pilot project. We started that project. And since then, it just, it's been kind of taking off like gangbusters at that point. I'm curious, since you've been doing this so long, what, you know, the discussion is like now versus the discussion then, because obviously it's advanced, I imagine, precipitously. <laughs> it has in certain areas. You know, what we have found is coming out of the first Oregon pilot and, and even moving into helping stand up Oregon and, and helping California and some of our other states. But what we found is there's really three major topics of conversation that come up with RUC. The first one's privacy. Second is equity or fairness. And then third is complexity. And what we have found is, you know, those three tenets still remain, they still, they're still in place. And those conversations are occurring even with states that are, you know, that have deployed one or two or even three pilot projects. What we're finding now, though, are ways that we can use this information to better support the motors, how we can use this information to better support EV adoption and how states can use this for uh, congestion management, for example how we can use pricing to adjust congestion in certain, you know, in central business districts or along major freeways. We're also looking at how we can use the technology that we're using in RUC to support other markets, things like tolling or uses-based insurance or even transportation network companies. And then carrying that one step further, how we can use the data for things like improved planning or emergency response or things like that. 
So the conversations have definitely evolved from just the simple plug-in devices. You know, we're now looking at how the OEMs can get involved and what they could bring to the table. But we're still going back to those three core tenets, privacy, fairness, and complexity for any client. Are you finding the conversations are opening up to where people are with those three tenants that you talked about are more open to having the discussion rather than just kind of being closed off and saying, well, that's never going to happen? Studies have helped. This concept has been around, actually, RUC has been around in the U.S. for uh, almost 20 years now. And pilot studies have certainly helped. You know, participation breeds familiarity. So what we're finding is people that get involved in these RUC pilots tend to ask more questions. They tend to ask more, uh, I don't want to say intelligent questions, but more experienced questions. And what that has done between that and then the conversations that have been occurring at both state and federal governments the conversations are progressing. You know, it's, it's not this immediate, absolutely not, we don't want to pursue this. It's, well, let's explore this because another state's done this, Oregon's done this, Washington's done this, California's done this. Let's explore what they have found and how we can apply it to our own state. So let's go back a little bit and just kind of go to the basics. So can you explain what a road user charge is and maybe why it's being discussed at all <laughs> to start off with? Yeah. So simply stated, road usage charge, it treats roads like a utility. You pay for every mile you drive. And instead of paying for road use based on the number of gallons that you put in your vehicle or the gas tax that's assessed on those gallons, you're paying based on every mile you drive. And what really started this here in the U.S. was uh, the influx of electric vehicles, the increase in vehicle fuel economy, and the declined purchasing power of the gas tax. The federal gas tax, for example, hasn't been raised since the early 90s. Many states haven't raised their gas taxes since then as well. So what we're finding is the purchasing power is declining as well. So with this influx of EVs, with the declining purchasing power of the gas tax, and with the increased fuel economy, states are starting to explore innovative methods to fund their transportation infrastructure. We've looked at a lot of different options, but what we've found is RUC really provides one of the more fair and future-focused solutions. What does that fairness look like? You know, I, I know a lot of people think that property taxes cover road building in the U.S., but that's not really necessarily true because there's property taxes, there's general fund transfers that have been happening at the federal level for a long time. Other mechanisms cover a lot more than people think. So I'm wondering about that fairness and, you know, how this might actually replace the gas tax, but also why we think it's an idea that works. And, and you just mentioned that, obviously, to a certain extent, but I want to kind of get a little bit deeper into it. What One of the things that, based on a per-gallon consumption model, vehicles that are less fuel efficient are purchasing more gallons of, more gallons of fuel, which means they're paying more gas tax, which means they are, they are effectively subsidizing those vehicles that have a higher fuel economy. Not taking emissions into consideration, not taking weight into consideration, it's just the vehicles that purchase more fuel, are paying more for road use than a vehicle that is more fuel efficient. So what RUC does is it levels that playing field. You have electric vehicles that some states have imposed uh, vehicle registration surcharges, but what we have found in a lot of states is that still doesn't equate to, you know, what an average vehicle would pay every month for road use. So RUC levels the playing field, uh, regardless of whether you're driving a less fuel efficient vehicle or you're driving an electric car you're theoretically going to pay the same per mile rate. It's interesting because I feel like, you know, another big discussion we're having right now nationally is about safety and street design, vehicle sizes, vehicle weights, because of now, because of battery packs being so heavy in these electric vehicles. And one of the kind of features of the gas tax was that, you know, you were kind of penalized for having a larger vehicle that got a worse gas mileage. And so I'm, I'm wondering, you know, in, in places like Japan, we've talked about recently on the show even, where vehicle sizes and engine displacement are the things that are taxed rather than necessarily the distances. So I'm wondering with the road user charge, do you kind of lose that disincentive to have larger vehicles that might impact safety or things like that? You know, what we what we have found is there's not a considerable amount of difference in weight between an EV and a larger truck. You know, we're looking at it from a vehicle, you know, how much degradation on the road is occurring. From a safety perspective, or you know, if you're wanting to incentivize a certain vehicle type or disincentivize others, you can certainly do that through variable pricing as well. I just think that's an interesting topic just because of that discussion. I, I know we also find that from a pollution standpoint, a lot of particulates and things like that are generated from brake dust and tire particles, not necessarily just the exhaust from a vehicle. And so heavier vehicles are actually taking up 30% more tires to operate an electric vehicle 
the same as as a vehicle that would be gas powered. So those other considerations are interesting. And you know, using the distance based charge rather than say a gas tax is kind of interesting to kind of put those things together and start to think about how they might mesh. So one of the things that we've been doing is you know we start with what we call a revenue neutral rate, and that's what's the average equivalency to the state motor fuel tax for a vehicle. You know, based on average fuel economy, based on the number of miles that vehicle would drive in a month or a year. And then we establish for these pilot studies what we call the revenue neutral rate. And then stakeholders, policymakers, you know, they can evaluate that rate. We can do, you know, certainly revenue forecasts can be done to determine what the financial impacts would be. And you can adjust that rate based on one to many different criteria. One of the other interesting things that I found from reading some of your materials was that folks in rural areas are worried about road user charges because they feel like they might get charged more. But in fact, that might not necessarily be the case. So there's studies going on with this right now. A lot of rural and tribal communities are topics of research for a lot of these current pilot projects. What we found is many rural residents, while they live further away from urban centers, they tend to chain trips together. They may drive to town, do grocery shopping, drop their mail off, dry cleaning, all of those things in a single trip, as opposed to someone in an urban or a suburban area where, you know, I may make five trips a day in my vehicle to do five different things at one, you know, five different things are spread out across the day. So what we're finding is the rural communities, absolutely, initially, the thought of a paying by the mile is certainly not well received, but if you start looking at driving patterns, if you start looking at how people are engaging in this or how they drive, you find that they're not paying any more than they would under the gas tax. I'm wondering if we can talk a little bit also about how it works in terms of reporting the miles driven, because I think that's a, a major sticking point for a lot of people as well in terms of how people actually tell whoever is collecting the funding, et cetera, the, whether it's a government or a special agency or anything like that, how do they report their mileage to and how do they figure out which roads they're driving on or, or do they? So there's multiple options out there to report road use, and they range from highly technical to even manual methods, you know, where some states, uh, a motorist could go in as part of their annual smog check and have their odometer read, and they just pay a ruck based on that change in odometer readings. The most common solution is the OBD2 plug-in device, or onboard diagnostic port plug-in device. It's a dongle, looks like the progressive snapshot that plugs into your diagnostics port on your vehicle. It reports every mile you drive. You can choose that option with or without a GPS, depending on you know if you want your location to be reported. It helps for out-of-state drivers, or if we're looking at variable per mile rates between urban or suburban areas, having that differentiation certainly helps. We've also explored options where you could use your cell phone. There's a solution out there that allows you to take a picture of your odometer at periodic intervals. And that information is transmitted to what we call an account manager. The account manager is the one that's responsible for collecting all the data, assessing the assessing the ruck that's owed, and then collecting those monies, aggregating those monies from all the users, and then submitting those monies to the state. So what we have found is there's third parties that do this. They do it on behalf of the states. So the state will contract with them to, you know, to do the account management for them. But what we have learned in our experience is these account managers provide They don't provide any personally identifiable information back to the state. So no individual location, no individual driving habits, no behaviors, things like that. It's just, you know, vehicle X drove X number of miles. Here's the amount of ruck that's owed. That's one of the three early pillars you talked about was privacy. You mentioned the collectors, but I'm curious, you know, is that something that really gets under people's skin in terms of discussing this topic? I I, (laughs) I imagine you've, you've heard a lot of different things from a lot of different people about it. It certainly is. You know, we, we even have people come to us and talk to us about, you know, why should I get involved in this? You know, what data are you collecting? What type of information are, are you reporting on me? And we encourage people like that to sign up for pilot studies, participate in it, you know, see what information is being collected. What information is being collected by the account manager? What information is being provided to the state? And again, going back to that participation breeds familiarity. Familiarity breeds acceptance. What we have found is our clients really have nothing to hide on this. It's truly, we want to fix a broken revenue system. And here's a way that we're exploring to do it. Have you had folks come back to you and be like, oh, I changed my mind. This is really interesting. And I hope that it goes forward. What we find is most people who participate in pilots, their acceptance increases tenfold. 
And why is that? Just because they've practiced it, they've seen what they've been sending and they're not worried about it? They see what's being collected. They see the information that's being used and they see how that's being used. And what they find is it's not, it's not the big scary monster that it was perceived to be. Another interesting idea I think people have come up with, maybe it's not so interesting, but you know, basically instead of a road user charge and kind of just replacing the gas tax as it stands, but with like an electron tax or something along those lines where you make people pay for the amount of energy that they're using. I'm curious if that comes up in conversation as well. It does. Actually, we've had clients that have explored, you know, comparing a, a ruck against a kilowatt hour charge you know, against a charging tax. What we have found is it's certainly possible to be considered. Some of the issues that we've encountered is a lot of people charge from home. So uh, being able to accurately report that information can be a challenge as someone charges their vehicle at home. The other thing that comes into play is how do you deal with out-of-state motorists? You know, how do you deal with a vehicle that, you know, from California that drives up into Oregon or drives up into Washington State? You know, how do you address those things? So We've looked at kilowatt hour charging. It's still a great topic to be explored, but uh, we're also looking at it with respect to a ruck, you know, how those two can even play together for that matter. Have you found from some of this research that people change their driving behavior because of a road user charge? Initially, they do. Uh, initially, and, and understand these are pilot studies, but what we have found is as people participate, initially, there's a lot of concern about reporting every mile they drive and you know do i really need do i really need to drive to the grocery store do i really need to make that trip what we found though is is over time it just becomes it becomes normal to people okay well yeah i really need to go to the grocery store i'm not going to worry about the the two cent per mile charge to get there because i'm getting the motor fuel tax credited back to me so it's it initial reactions are rough, and then as people start <laughs> to participate, it becomes a little bit easier to stomach. Yeah. So one of the big discussions we have lately in in our space in active transportation is the overall need to reduce VMT for for climate change purposes, and in order to reach all of our climate goals, our friends over at RMI in Boulder, I think near where you are, basically have shown that this is the case. That we need other solutions, and I'm I'm wondering if road user charges are part of that toolkit of trying to reduce overall VMT. It is. So we have several clients that are exploring RUC as a congestion management tool. Or could you use pricing as a congestion mitigation tool? Could you use it you know, to assign higher rates during peak period travel? Those are all policy levers that can be used. We have encouraged our clients, don't muddy the two. You know, understand that there is a need to create a sustainable revenue source. The per gallon funding model is antiquated. And, you know, while RUC can certainly be used to manage congestion, mitigate emissions, improve environmental quality, you still have to create a sustainable, maintained transportation funding stream. You know, what you don't want to do is you don't want to reduce VMT to the expense of adding more potholes to your road or, not, or being unable to repair those roadways. I'm curious about your phrase there, muddying the tube. Can you explain that a little bit more? What we have found is the policy levers between RUC and congestion pricing are very different. Hmm. When we first started RUC, RUC was originally intended to create a sustainable revenue stream for transportation that is predicated on a set VMT or predicated on VMT. As you start looking at congestion pricing, what you find is you have goals to reduce VMT. You know, so as long as you have clear goals and objectives up front as to those two things, they can coexist. But you don't want to try to create a sustainable revenue stream all the while trying to reduce VMT. Does that make sense? Kind of. I mean, I, I personally would want to reduce driving <laughs> from from the perspective of most of my listeners. That's something that I think is is valuable in terms of trying to reduce emissions overall and, you know, sprawl and those types of things. And so I appreciate the idea that it's a policy lever that needs to be pulled, but it's also something that if state DOTs are looking for specific revenue sources to be replacements, then maybe our goals are not aligned. And I think that's probably the case with a lot of state DOTs and the folks maybe that listen to this show. What we have found is we are engaging MPOs, we are engaging environmental advocacy groups California Resource Board, for example, they are monitoring what's going on with state RUC programs. They certainly are providing input into these state RUC programs. What we're finding is we want them to have an active voice. We want them to actually shape policy and work hand in hand with all the other stakeholders. 
to create a sustainable revenue stream that either reduces VMT by moving people to transit, it reduces emissions by increasing the number of electric vehicles on the road, but at the end of the day, it's creating safer, less congested roadways. It's interesting to compare, and CARB is another interesting case, just because they've said even that there's a need to reduce VMT, but then they're going to leave it up to everybody else to figure out how to do that, right? They've kind of passed the buck on that to a certain extent. But it's also interesting when you think about California's cap and trade program and how the more you reduce emissions each year, the prices go up, and then eventually you're going to get rid of emissions, and so you're going to run out of that revenue source, right? And so that's an interesting kind of comparison that way in thinking about if you're trying to reduce VMT, that means reduced revenue. Does that mean higher prices or does that mean different taxes or you know policy levers that you pull? And so I think that comparison also is kind of an interesting one too. It certainly opens up the topic of conversation. What we have found through all of our studies is communications is key and not just with the public. I, I think it's it's creating a common set of language, a common set of understanding as to how transportation is funded and really getting the right goals and objectives to the table. Because what you don't want to do is you don't want to roll out a program and then have somebody, have another group come in and say, oh, well, what about this? Or what about this? Or what about this? You want to, you want to cast as wide a net as possible, in my opinion. I'm also interested from the insurance standpoint, too. A lot of companies have started to do per mile or at least low mileage policies for, for users. And that's really interesting. And we had actually David Hencher on the show uh, from the University of Sydney talking about this recently about mobility as a feature and mobility as a service as a replacement. And he was discussing how it's possible to create a suite of transportation options and promote sustainable and high capacity modes if everything was connected in the same system. And I feel like you all have had that kind of thought too, or at least been thinking along those lines, connecting insurance and mobility writ large with the road user charge. There are several states have explored what we call the mobility marketplace concept. And it's really consolidating transportation services under a single platform where you can plan, reserve, and pay for all of your transportation, all of your mobility solutions, everything from tolling, parking, electric charging, RUC, insurance, pay-as-you drive registration, all of these components under a single platform. It's also interesting just because of the thinking from an insurance perspective, if you're trying to, say, uh, not pay out as many claims, right? you're going to try to get more people to take active transportation or maybe get them on a bus or a train rather than drive their car more often. And so actually it makes sense to them to fold these in as incentives to promote other transportation modes than your car. You're obviously going to have a car if you live in certain parts of the country and you're going to use it, but then you can also incentivize ways for them to drive less. And I think that ties into the data that you all might collect and then the, and the information that you might get from a road user charge system. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think what it really boils down to is better understanding how mobility is being affected, understand how pricing is affecting mobility, and then exploring what other options are out there. We did a study for a state where we explored all trips that were a mile or less. And we called it, you know, could they have taken transit? Could they have walked? Could they have biked? And what we found was in exploring those trips, there were several intersections that they weren't conducive for walking. They weren't safe for, for pedestrians or there weren't transit routes that went by. So what we're using is we're using this information from these studies to help them, to help better inform transit planning, capacity planning on certain corridors, even emissions. You know, are there ways that we can alter trip patterns or alter time of day travel to help reduce emissions in certain communities? That's interesting with what's come up the pandemic and thinking about all of the work from home folks that um, more you know high income folks have been doing is that change and that switch in rush hour, the amount of congestion that's actually happened at what time of day. I think that's really fascinating to see how that impact has occurred and also what that means for any future research or actually policy that people might come up with. Yeah, absolutely. What's the most interesting thing about all of this to you? I mean, you've been doing it for such a long time. I'm curious if there's something that really just get you excited or, or makes you think, wow, this is something that's really on the edge of being super cool. You know, I, I, with every state, with every new state I work with, it fascinates me the nuances of each state and even the nuances within each community. What we have found is, for example, we're doing a study right now with uh, rural and tribal communities. And, you know, how a ruck could affect tribal communities. And we're finding some very interesting input from the tribes as to how a ruck could affect them. I've also, you know, I geek out on the technology. 
So to me, finding ways <laughs> that we could use REC technology to improve tolling, you know, to reduce tolling administrative fees or to help reduce congestion. We did a study in the Midwest where we actually explored assessing a ruck on an electric vehicle and ran it down a managed lane to determine if we could use the technology to determine what lane the vehicle was in. And we could. So we started looking at could we use this per mile methodology to support managed lanes, to support tolling, to support, like you said, uses based insurance and those types of mechanisms. So, you know, there's so many things that are exciting to this. But to me, it's meeting with these new clients engaging stakeholders around the country, uh, explaining what this is. Obviously, the the initial reaction of the arms crossed and the furrowed brow, but once you start <laughs> explaining what it is, you encourage people to participate in these initiatives. Seeing those, seeing those lights come on and saying, oh, this isn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. I imagine you've thought about the negative impacts too, maybe, and what some of the nefarious things that state DOTs or, or folks could use with road user charges. I'm wondering if some of those have come across your, <laughs> your platform. No, I, you know, um, I think because it's so new, you know, it's still a relatively new concept. There really hasn't been a lot of nefarious topics that have come up. You know, there, there's obviously concerns about the type of data that the state collects and how they're going to use that information. What we have found is most people don't understand how roads are funded. So the minute we start explaining how, how roads are funded, it becomes a question as to how the state is spending their tax dollars. And so then you start getting questions about inefficiencies and overlap and duality of services and things like that. But I, I think I, I wouldn't say that's necessarily nefarious. Rather, it's just educating and it's creating opportunities for the states to really disclose how they do things. The discussion about quote unquote double charging is, is I guess, a, a really big deal now because the folks in New Jersey are really upset about, you know, and I know this is congestion pricing and not necessarily RUC, but folks in New Jersey are really worried about getting double charged and the few people that actually drive into Manhattan, which is a very low amount percentage wise. But I, th I feel like that's a discussion that happens a lot when you talk about revenue and whether people are going to get charged twice for something and whether if you know, you're driving on a toll road and you're paying a road user charge, are those things going to overlap and are you going to quote unquote double pay? And so I, f I feel like that's probably a big discussion you have too. It is. The first question that comes out is, am I going to be charged a per mile charge plus the motor fuel tax? And you know, for a simple RUC program, the answer is no. These account managers and, and every account manager I've worked with clearly states this on the invoice. They credit the they credit the number of gallons consumed back times the motor fuel tax. So it shows as a credit on the invoice. Regarding whether someone pays tolls or pays any other types of charges, again, that's a policy lever. The ideal situation is you consolidate those charges under a single platform. But right now, people are paying the gas tax to drive on a toll road already. So it's not really a double tax. You're just paying two fees. You're paying one to operate your vehicle on a road, and then you're paying a premium to use that toll road. Yeah, I feel like that's an important thing to mention is that you're paying premium to drive on a premium road because it might have it might be a bypass of something or it might be a way to get to, you know, for example, we have tolls to get into San Francisco on the Bay Bridge and on the Golden Gate Bridge. And so that's, you know, obviously that bridge is infrastructure. It needs to be maintained. And, and so you're going to have to pay that in one form or fashion or another. Well, right now in San Francisco, we also have a ton of electric self-driving vehicles running around and testing. And one of the negative impacts of these vehicles in, in, in the long run, in my opinion, is going to be the zombie miles that they drive. And right now is all zombie miles too, because they're not really carrying passengers and they're just testing. And so currently 10% of human driving is even zombie miles because as I think it was the Fed's research just showed that 10% of driving is actually searching for parking, circling around and looking for a place to park. So I'm wondering what the zombie miles, you know, if we do get to this autonomous future, which I'm obviously kind of skeptical of as well, but if we get to this autonomous future, we have zombie miles, how does that play into like a road user charge? Are, are they going to be let off the hook or are they going to be made to pay more because they're creating more congestion? I guess that's a policy question too. I'm curious about your thoughts about that potential future. Sure. Yeah. I, I'm talking about this strictly from an electric vehicle perspective. Obviously, zombie miles with an emissions component, and there's a different play on that. And I think there are ways that we can use technology to help people find parking spaces or to effectively go to a route instead of burning zombie miles, trying to find a parking spot or to trying to circle around the airport waiting for that ride. It's certainly going to be a topic of conversation. It's certainly going to it's, where it should play is in the rate setting conversations. Understand that there is going to be a per mile charge and that per mile charge is going to be assessed based on 
every mile that's traveled, regardless of whether it's going to a destination or whether it's circling around, you know, a central business district. But how that rate's set, those are really where those considerations lead come into play. What's the tipping point for Ruck in states and, and at the federal level? What's the thing that might actually bring more people on board? Well, I, I think it goes back to addressing those for those three pillars that we started this mm-hmm. conversation with. I think there's a complexity component that needs to be addressed too. And what we have found is it's really finding champions, whether it was in Oregon or Washington or Minnesota, all the states that are exploring these programs, legislative champions tend to gain the most traction. At the federal level, there's been some tremendous legislative champions that have supported these initiatives. So to me, that's really going to be key is finding those mouthpieces, finding those champions to set up and say, this is a viable solution. Here's all the work that's been done to support it. Let's explore this moving forward. I I don't know if you're familiar with the national BMT trial that's in the IJA. Mm-hmm. That's going to be a great opportunity to showcase a lot of the accomplishments that have been done around the country. I was going to ask you about kind of the most recent bills, the IJA and then the Inflation Reduction Act, and kind of how that's impacted the discussion. It's definitely gaining some interest in states. Um, prior to this, there was Section 6020 of the FAST Act, the Surface Transportation System Funding Alternatives Grant. That certainly started the conversation. It was a six-year, $95 million grant program for states or groups of states to pilot RUC. And that actually, that opened the floodgates for these studies. Moving forward, the new state grant program and the national trial both offer opportunities for states to continue these studies. So, you know, that's definitely the biggest, to me, that's breaking down the biggest hurdle is putting funding out there, putting opportunities out there for these clients to start studying what it would look like. And everything from educating their public all the way through doing trials and, and doing analyses. What's next for you all? You know, I, I, I think the future is <laughs> bright, frankly. You know, we're starting to look at how collecting real money affects driver behavior. How those monies, how ruck dollars would be collected, deposited, and allocated. Are there federal systems like IFTA, for example, that could support you know, this type of process? On the technology front, it's it's continuing to explore ways that we could use this technology to improve safety, to integrate it with other data sources. On the education front, it's it's really just continuing to reiterate the messages how transportation is funded, understanding that the gas tax, there's some there's a lot of elegance in the gas tax because it's been around for so long. People put gasoline in their car and they don't even think about that it's tied directly to road use. So we're having to uh, re-educate people on how that happens, how those funds are used. So long answer to a short question, I I think the big thing for us is there's a lot of opportunity for us to continue working with states to promote the concept and then starting to bring some of these examples forward on a national stage. Awesome. Well, where can folks find more information about road user chargers or the work that you all are doing? Yeah, absolutely. It's www.wsp.com. And then if you search for road usage charge, we have a lot of information up there on a lot of the work we've done, a lot of the case studies that we've developed. But that's www.wsp.com slash en dash us slash services slash road usage charging. Or the best way to do it is just Google road usage charging WSP. And you get you guys a bitly link. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, Mike, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate your time. It was great, Jeff. Thank you so much. And thanks for joining us. The Talking Headways podcast is a project of The Overhead Wire and published first at Streets Blog USA. Thanks to our wonderful Patreon supporters for sponsoring this week's show and Mondays at The Overhead Wire. Find us at patreon.com slash The Overhead Wire. And you can sign up for our 16-year-old newsletter at TheOverheadWire.com. And you can also listen to our show on your podcatcher of choice, including Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, and Apple Podcasts. And if you can't find it there, you can always find its original home at usa.streetsblog.org. We'll see you next time at Talking Headways.